You are listening to the Awake Athlete Podcast. I'm Jessica Mkowski, endurance athlete and mindset coach, here to share with you perspectives and contemplations from a 10,000-foot view of life. Hello, Awake Athlete community. Always so pumped to be back in the closet because when I go in the closet, it means I've been inspired to share. And I'm hot off the trails. I went for a trail run this morning. And I was at this point, I was on my favorite trail. I don't know what it's called. I call it the racetrack. And I love to run up it and I love to run down it. It's short. It's it's really not technical. And it's got all these little S curves. It's just super fun in both directions. And uh, wow, isn't that the goal of life, right? Not that it's super fun, but that we let go of the preference or the limitation that I have to run down this trail and it's too hard to run up the trail. It's just I've gotten to a point now where I love this trail either way. However I meet it, I just allow the direction to be there. The The zooming out and the general piece of it is I love this trail. So for me, it doesn't matter if I'm going up it or I'm coming down it. But today I was going up it. And today was one of those, man, it was one of those runs where the universe just throws you a bone and you're like, what, what, like that thing in my ankle or the planner, what, like nothing's there, you know? And uh, you just feel so good and you feel like you're in a new body and you can do anything. And gosh, it was one of those runs. And we have to have both. We have to have, we have to have the contrast. We really do. Um, The contrast of the days where I go out there and I feel like the Tin Man Those are oftentimes the bigger growth opportunities. So I'm on the trails today and I'm coming up my favorite trail and I get to this point where I can really see like other trails that are far away from me. The tree line's not high on this, in this trail system at all. And so there's a peak that actually is an old, is a volcano that erupted many, 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 many years ago. And one side is like super steep. And I just happened to just have a moment. I stopped. I paused my watch because God forbid, you know, the clock is ticking when the pace is not happening. It slows everything down, right? Don't forget about how self-absorbed we are. And um, and I just noticed like somebody was really power hiking up the steep side of the peak. Somebody was coming down the peak really, really slow. Somebody else was going up the peak and they were stopping to take a breather. Then I kind of glanced around at the lower trails and I saw some people walking and I saw some people running. They just looked like they were floating. And I realized like, gosh, isn't that life, right? Like we're all on our own schedule. We're all on our own journey. And we all come into this world really pre-programmed to how we're going to navigate things. And It's about seeing where we are now, like where am I now on this journey and where do I want to go and how often do we stop and say, where am I now and where do I want to go? And this ability to be aware of how we move through the world is everything to being able to overcome limiting belief systems, uh, patterns that have become least action pathways, meaning it takes the least amount of effort for us to go down that road to, you know, have that reaction or practice that behavior. And when we slow down and we become aware, we get to look at those things and we get to go into inquiry, right? Yoga is such a a facilitator of curiosity. And geez, is the thing I'm doing actually really serving me? And I want to tie this in today with the yoga of food. I just feel like this is such a potent topic. And I've heard some people, like they kind of hesitate from talking about food because it is so emotional for other people. But I can tell you I've run the gamut with my relationship to food and where I am now and the curiosity that yoga has encouraged me to keep alive in my life and also the practice of detaching not only from the food that I put in my body, but also from my body itself. Like I'm not the body. The body is what I live in and the food is what I put in the body in order to keep the body going because the body needs food. It needs water. It needs food. It needs to be cleaned. It needs to be emptied. It gets sick. Sometimes it gets diseased. And then eventually, you guys, it dies. 
And I'm not glossing over that, but death is a part of life. And I can't remember where I read it, but I remember it was, it might even have been like scripture. And of course, this is all translated through the filter of my mind, the just mind, which which the way I recall it is there was some mystic or sage that was talking about the body and basically saying, this is the cliff notes through the filter of my mind. Like, everybody thinks the body's so great. Body's not that great. Like, you got it takes a lot of work. You got to feed it. It gets old. Stuff starts to sag. Hair grows out of things that you never thought hair could grow out of. Like, And we put so much pressure and so much um, glorification on how the body looks and this this resistance to the body aging. And yes, it is a temple, you guys. It is a temple, but it's not who we are. So when we recognize that the body is not who we are, and really the mind is not who we are, we adopt a a detachment, which doesn't mean that we're apathetic about the body. It doesn't mean that we're complacent, like, oh, I guess it's just the way it is. No, it's we treat it like a temple, We treat it like a temple. And the more I look at my body as a temple and I feel my body as a temple, I want to feel it like a temple. And so, yes, sometimes I bring chips into the temple. And so that's just where I'm at. For whatever reason, that craving is strong and the impulse is strong and I watch the impulse and I make conscious choice when I bring that kind of quote unquote, non-food into my life. Like I've played the game, like it's potatoes and it's salt and I'm an athlete, but it's not food, you guys. There's nothing about it that is high vibrational. When we deep fry things, we can take things that are very high vibrational, like broccoli or cauliflower or potatoes, and we can make them very low vibrational through the processes through which we put the food through. But, you know, we all like to hear good news about our bad habits and really, I just want to share some some truth about things and some perspectives. I'm not here to change you, but I hope that you are curious about being curious. And so I want to talk today, the yoga of food, about this really foundational tenet of yoga, which is ahimsa. And I just was oh, so grateful to take part in a full day retreat that was online through the Integral Yoga Institute in New York City. Uh, co-hosted with Victoria Moran from Main Street Vegan, which if you are plant curious or you're already vegan, uh, great book, Main Street Vegan. It really is. It's a great book. So let's say you're already plant-based. It really assisted me in answering questions better. And then always, there's always something to learn. So I took so much away and there's great recipes in there. And then if you're plant curious, Um, definitely check it out because the whole thing about Main Street Vegan is, you know, eating a plant-based diet, it's not elitist. It's It's for everyone on Main Street. And that was really her intention when she wrote the book. So Victoria presented, she was the first presenter at the event the other day, and she was talking about ahimsa and a vegan diet. And the way that she described it is, you know, ahimsa is the development of a mental attitude in which hatred is replaced by love. Like, that's amazing, right? I have hated my body before. I have hated it. And that is very violent. And that was a very long time ago, and before I knew it was a temple, And now I know it's a temple, and I want that temple to shine. I just want it to shine. I want to love it. It's 49 years old. And so there, you know, things are happening. But if you know a backstory on my meditation practice, one of the reasons, one of the things that got me to go all in was the actual anti aging benefits that we've seen that it actually lengthens the end caps on your DNA. So it, it reverses aging. And hey, I don't care how you get to meditation, if it's because you want to become one with the universal mind or you don't want to age so fast, it doesn't matter. Just get to the cushion. So I loved that, right? It replaces hatred with love. It's beautiful. Ahimsa, as she described it, is cosmic love. And then she described um, the fitness food groups, which I love that, right? The fitness food groups, fruits, legumes, nuts, seeds, veggies, and whole grains. You know, when I first turned vegan, I did it to benefit my athletic performance. And I'm not embarrassed to say that, you know, at first it wasn't about the animals, despite being an animal lover my whole life. And I think that that's really 
speaks to the truth of the veil, you know, that is draped in front of our eyes, that we live in a society that keeps the violence hidden from us. Um, so during this experience with the Yoga Goes Vegan event, we had a special treat where we had uh, Rishi Chirananda come and speak. And this was kind of a last minute off the itinerary uh, gift that we all received. And he gave us two reasons, you know, just two reasons. He talked for like 20 minutes and he just gave us two main reasons, you know, to consider a diet and really a life of ahimsa. Ahimsa is about doing the least amount of harm in any given situation. And our society has become so greedy, right? So how Rishi Chinananda phrased it was, the greed of humanity has become so powerful that we will kill to fulfill our desires. So we will be a part of violence so that we can have the stake. And to me, that is such a powerful statement that our desires, my desire for those potato chips can be really, really strong. My desire for flank steak used to be strong. I had belief systems that were backing up that desire, saying that I needed that for what I was doing. But I don't have that desire anymore at all now that I have the knowledge and also that I live in my plant-based temple, which feels better than it ever did when I was eating animal products. So the two reasons that Rishi Chirananda shared for considering uh, a plant-based diet or moving in that direction is number one, to be in service. We are here to be in service of others, to be in service of the good of all. And now don't forget, the good of all includes you. So we are in service of ourselves. We feed our temples high vibrational food so that we can be as healthy as we can possibly be to live our dharma in this life, to serve our purpose. When we eat a higher vibrational diet, we become higher vibrational beings. What we put in us becomes us. So he says in relation to the animals that the best way to be in service of animals is to not make them suffer. Really, really simple, right? To be in service, so reason number one. Reason number two that he gave was the frequencies of the meat. So you know, we're talking about beings that have central nervous systems that don't want to die. So um, I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to go into graphic detail. Um, but they're fearful and they can sense it. And that fear is energy and it gets into the tissues just like it does with us, you guys. When we experience trauma or conflict in our life, if we don't fully process it, if we don't give ourselves the chance to fully process it. And by the way, there's no elementary school class about processing feelings like nobody ever taught us how to do this stuff and so we stuff it and our tissues hold this stuff it holds resentment it holds frustration it holds non-forgiveness it holds non-loving thoughts it holds all of these things and that that is a frequency of energy and so that energy is also in the tissues of animals. The other thing is just 80% of antibiotics in this world are being pumped into animals who are being raised for slaughter because the desires of humanity have become so powerful that we will kill to have a filet mignon. And those chemicals, they're getting into the atmosphere. Not only are they getting into the meat, but they're getting into the atmosphere. They're being absorbed. They're coming down in the rain and they're everywhere. So the frequency of that meat is also has a lot of toxicity in it as well. So you can say, well, antibiotic-free, grass-fed, you can do all of that. Awesome. Where are you on the path? Where you are is perfect. It's perfect. Are you charging up the mountain? Are you stopping to get curious? Are you kind of fearful of the descent that you're making, letting go of the eggs or letting go of the things that you believe that you need? Wherever you are, you are right on time. You are right on schedule. But the difference between being awake and not being awake is when you are awake, you're, you're being curious about, is what I'm doing moving me in the direction of the person I want to be in the life that I want to live? And what do I want to do here while I'm on this earth? Because remember, death is a part of life. As I sit here, there are cells dying. As I ran on the trail this morning, perhaps I stepped and killed ants, you know, 
we are causing harm all the time. So ahimsa is not nullifying death, but it's doing the least amount of harm in any given situation. Because just like Isaac Newton proved to us in Newton's third law that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, this is the same law as karma. And we must pay those karmic debts. We must pay them. So to hold an intention of ahimsa in your life is really a wonderful teammate on your path to self-realization, on your path to becoming even more awake, allowing that veil to thin, to reach enlightenment, which truly is to be enlightened, is to see things as they are. It's not always about feeling good and being happy. No, there's a lot of suffering on this planet. But to be able to see things as they are, and not from a place of apathy or complacency, but from a place where you are feeling it and letting it pass through you, burning that karma, the tapas, uh, is the niyama, another tenet of, of uh, the science of yoga, which is like the burning of it all, the burning when we shine a light on the suffering, the burning when we shine a light on violence. It hurts. So where are we now and where do we want to go and is there anything that we're doing that's holding us back or limiting ourselves in going where we desire to go in this life? So, yeah, I mean, I turned vegan for athletic performance and really at that time it wasn't vegan. It took me a long time to use that word and it, I don't use that word to put myself in a box. I just I use it because it has meaning to me. It, it goes hand in hand with this intention of ahimsa. So what happened when I went plant-based was I was trading for Ironman Lake Placid at the time. And so I had moments of being scared, you guys. I was so scared I wasn't getting what I needed. But I just kept going because it was on my heart to really give this a shot and be curious and see you know, if I could experience what I was reading from Brendan Brazier and Rick, Rich Roll and Scott Jurek and, and all of these really pioneers, athlete pioneers in this movement. And, you know, what was happening was I was experiencing quicker recoveries. Overall, I was just bouncing from workout to workout with more sustained energy. But there was something else that was happening that I think is really potent to share with you guys. There was something deeper than the physical. It was something so profound. And at the same time, it was common sense. I was no longer angry. My frustration was subsiding. My fear was melting away. My suffering was lightening. And I realized that I was being freed as I was freeing others. I was no longer eating the dead flesh of an animal that wanted to live. And I was no longer a cog in the wheelhouse of violence. I was not eating the secretions of a mother's milk that were meant for her baby, and I was no longer taking part in the violation of another's right to live or to bond with their offspring. Oh, that one probably hit me the hardest. I was now a participant in freeing others from their shackles, bars, cages, and oppression. And I was learning more and more about the industries that I supported for decades and nothing that I was finding felt normal, natural, or necessary. So what was happening, you guys, is that this stuff was getting kicked up. The stuff that was being held in my tissues that I was no longer contributing to was starting to kick up. And this happens when you start to change your cellular structure and the vibrational resonance of your being. I was experiencing bouts of intense grief, followed by deep journeys into self-forgiveness as the stillness of meditation allowed me to heal. And the absence of the violence in my diet, it was something that was notable and I could not deny the effect that it was having in my life. So yoga has taught me many things you know, that have transformed my relationships uh, with myself, how I move through the world. But at the base of it all, it's the principle of nonviolence that I believe a, an awake athlete is truly born from. And so it's seeing where we are. And if we're not okay with where we are, that's our first step on the journey. How do we become okay? And that doesn't mean 
happy and go lucky. It means how do we become calm when we truly see how we're moving through the world? You might look at how you're moving through the world and feel very calm and very content. Okay, so what more can you do to feel more calm, more great, more high vibrational, be in service? You're in a great place. Let's expand that. Let's express that more. For me, when I saw how I was moving through the world and how I wanted to move through the world and who I wanted to be and what I wanted to stand for, it was a disconnect and it was really, really hard to look at. But I felt it all, you know? And so this experience is mine. Nonviolence has taught me to really meet people where they're at. I'm not angry if you're not vegan. I'm not. I'm not. But I encourage you to look at, is it serving you? The answer might be yes. And the answer might be like, oh, I've kind of been thinking about this. And my question is, how can you expand ahimsa in your own life. Maybe you're not ready to do it on your plate yet. Maybe you're not ready for this yoga of food yet. But where can you do it in your tone, in your thought life, in your interaction with others, how you feel about others and their actions? How can you expand ahimsa in your life? So, you know, because this ahimsa has been so powerful, you know, it's I don't shame people who eat meat. I don't. I'm not a meat shamer, but I'm definitely a plant pusher. And I think we can all agree that more fruits and vegetables and color on our plate is to the benefit of all beings. So living in a himsa life to me means that I'm no better because I'm vegan, but that what I'm contributing to the world is aligned with my highest truth. So what is your highest truth right now And is what you're doing in your life aligned with that? And this is the beauty of free will. And this is the beauty of being awake is that we can see where those disconnects are. And when we locate a disconnect, ah, it sucks. It hurts. But the key is to see it. Feel what that feels like. Don't stuff it. Feel it. Don't expand it. But don't stuff it. Feel it. Let it move through you. Let it transmute. We cannot create or destroy energy, but we can transmute it. And in this case, when we come up with those disturbances, when we feel those disturbances within us, we can transmute that back to love. And we transmute it back to love by offering no resistance, no fight. Let it move. It'll move. And it'll move so much quicker without our interference. So feel it. Breathe. Let it go and become who you truly want to be in this life and live in the beautiful temple that you've been gifted. It is your divine right to find the quiet and the peace and the non-harming self that already lives within you.